How should Muslims respond to burning the Holy Quran in Sweden Part 2? The Islamic response to the Quran burning fiasco, jihad. If there's anything that the last few weeks on the international news scene have shown us, it would be how difficult it is to not fall into the trap of giving what should have been the non-story of a single individual's attempts at insulting the noble Quran yet further attention and coverage. This is especially the case considering the fact that the Quran is sadly desecrated by enemies of humanity on a regular basis many news reports have shown this to be true and a brief foray into. The online freak world of the extreme right wing will show the true reality of a deep-set destructive hatred which can't always have heroes like Jacob Isom around to save the day. Or at least save the Quran, because of course as has now been written into the annals of modern history, dude, you have no Quran. Keep supporting Muslim matters for the sake of Allah. The fact that there is a concerted effort in much of the populist media and even some areas of academia willfully misrepresenting and rewriting Islam as something unrecognizable to Muslims is far worse than the childish rhetoric of the fascinatingly style-conscious yet utterly naive Pastor Jones, who although claiming to speak on behalf of America and Christianity, has actually proved that carpentry may be the only thing he has in common with the Prophet Jesus. But seriously, how does the Orthodox Muslim respond to such outrageous and unacceptable attacks against God's own spoken word, the last testament to mankind? Disrespect to the Quran is more than just a slap in the face to Muslims. Rather it is a knife in the heart of every believer who realizes the true status of the most sanctified representation of God's message on the face of the earth. Moreover, considering that the Islamic belief in God is not just an abstract thought in the mind, but rather a living, breathing. Active theology which engages every aspect of society designed to respond to every single challenge in modern life itself then no Muslim needs to be restricting themselves to pacifism or a defensive apologetic approach. It is clear that such actions like those of Pastor Jones are intended only to outrage, provoke violence, and force the Muslims to respond in the strongest way possible. Thus for such insults and disgrace, Islam has indeed specifically legislated a clear and unequivocal response to those who would treat it in this way, jihad. Yes. Jihad. Let's look at what God himself says in the Quran. So do not give in to the disbelievers, strive hard against them with it. 25,52. So do not follow the disbelievers in their demands for you to be soft with them and in the proposals that they put forward. Strive against them with this Quran that has revealed to you a mighty struggle by being patient over their harm and tolerating difficulties in calling them to Allah. Al Furqan, 52. The wording in the Arabic here is very clear, Jahad Hamayi make jihad against them yet it won't escape you that the weapon to be used during this act of jihad is referred to as simply it. Thus the mind could quite rightly start to think about machine guns, knives, bombs or whatever way possible to cause as much death and destruction through revenge as possible, right? Wrong. You see, when your religious narrative is taken out of the hands of Islamic scholars and instead hijacked by Muslim extremists on one side and non-Muslim extremists on the other, it is easy to see why the very mention of the word jihad causes the hearts of millions of people to skip a beat and then bring forth the standard hate-filled rhetoric we've become so accustomed to. Through those bastions of public news services such as the Al-Qaeda news group or the slightly less clandestine Fox News network. But if we were to ask the experts and scholars of Islam what the weapon in this verse actually is, you will find a near consensus that the weapon is the Quran itself. Read and check virtually every single book of Tafsir, Quranic exegesis, and you will find the same statement each time, leading us to now translate the above verse as. So do not give in to the disbelievers, strive hard against them with this Quran. 25,52 So do not follow the disbelievers in their demands for you to be soft with them and in the proposals that they put forward. Strive against them with this Quran that has revealed to you a mighty struggle by being patient over their harm and tolerating difficulties in calling them to Allah. al Furqan, 52 What this noble verse tells us is very important. We are firstly shown directly what the true meaning of jihad actually means i.e. to strive. We also learn more importantly that as a Muslim community that often comes under attack for a number of reasons some self-inflicted. Others not so, our response is not to be based upon our own emotions and opinions. Every true Muslim's heart will be full of rage against anyone who would disrespect Holy Scripture. Many thoughts might go through our mind on how to respond, but God himself commands the believers to be patient, be steadfast, and to convey the true message of the Quran. If someone attacks the religion, then you respond with that which is better. 
If someone wishes to engage in ignorance, you respond by education. Strive hard against all antagonists with the arguments and proofs of the current itself. And don't turn to anger and hatred lest irrationality and emotion causes you to do something which is far removed from Islam. The actions of extreme right-wing racists, xenophobes or just simple Islamophobic people are all aimed at provoking an equally mindless and emotive response. So that it can justify their own ignorance and transgression in the first place. Reacting in such a fashion is not what Muslims should do. It really isn't. We neither descend to such depths of human depravity in our responses and neither do we act in a fashion that causes even more problems and damage. Islam, the Quran, and the Prophet Muhammad, upon whom be peace, have always been attacked by the ignorant. Sadly, this is not the first time and it won't be the last. Yet our course of action and the mode of our behavior should mirror that of the one who was sent to perfect all actions and modes of behavior. When the Prophet was jeered at by the aggressors of the Quraysh tribe and was insulted by being called Mud Hamamayi the rebuked one, he turned to his companions and said, that's what they say. But I am Muhammad Ayi the praised one. And truly, O Muhammad, you are on an exalted standard of character. 68 4 And indeed, you are definitely on the greatest of character that the one. Quran has brought, you are embodied with it to the most perfect degree. al Kalam 4 Despite the treachery and enmity shown by some of the Jewish tribes when the Prophet went to Medina, he was still recognized as the authority in the city. He was requested to judge in an adultery case between two Jews and once the Prophet, upon whom be peace, arrived at the house known as Beit el -Midris. He was seated inside and given a cushion for his comfort. The Prophet wanted to use Jewish law to give the ruling and asked for the Old Testament to be brought forward, the Torah, and when it was brought to him. He gently took the cushion out from underneath himself and then placed the Torah upon it, and said, I believe in you, and in he who sent you. And truly, O Muhammad, you are on an exalted standard of character. 68 4 And indeed, you are definitely on the greatest of character that the one. Quran has brought, you are embodied with it to the most perfect degree. al Kalam 4 the attitude of the Muslim with sacred scripture couldn't be more removed from that of the extremist bigots who have captured the headlines. This example of the Prophet Muhammad with the Old Testament speaks volumes, despite the Islamic belief that insertions have been made and the text changed from the original message of the Torah. Yet for the reason that it is a book, and more than that a book of knowledge, and more than that a book of scripture, and more than that a book held to be sanctified and loved by a people. That we likewise show it respect and honor. All of these four features are individual and separate blessed reasons why Muslims must act the way that their Prophet shows them. We cannot take responsibility for the actions of others, but we certainly will be held accountable for our own decisions and actions. And at this time when ignorance has become the order of the day, our response really has to be the education of the other through jihad with the Quran. We must take this opportunity to explain to people the real message behind the Last Testament, to encourage people to look inside and read instead of burn. To become proactive and reach out to the masses by showing them the great injustice they are doing to themselves by disrespecting one of the world's greatest books of Holy Scripture. The ignorant might wish to burn us inside by setting ablaze God's word, but if it does make you smolder, then at least burn like incense, bring beauty, fragrance. Benefit and guidance to humanity by living and promoting the word as it should be. Mocking the Prophet, how should we react? How should we Muslim react to mockery of our Prophet Muhammad or should we even react at all? Just like the cartoons few years ago, the Muslim response to the recent film has been very diverse. From the very mild of responses to the very violent ones, what's most noteworthy is the enormity of the response. Despite the consensus that the film did not deserve the attention it was getting, social media kept being flooded, and still is, with messages defending the Prophet. So, before another incident of mockery takes place, since it seems that it's only a matter of time before someone else tries to play on the sensitivities of Muslims, let's take some time to examine what the Quran has to say about this very issue. Mockery is tantamount to ignorance. Almost every Muslim knows the story of the cow, Surat al-Baqarah. After all, the longest chapter of the Quran is named after this story. To get to the gist, there was an unsolved murder that happened among the children of Israel during the time of Moses, as, Musa. So Allah revealed to Moses that in order to solve the murder your people have to slaughter a cow. 
Of course, when Moses told his people of God's command, their first reaction was shock and disbelief, e.g. what slaughtering a cow got to do with solving a murder? The Quran says. Remember when Moses said to his people, God commands you to sacrifice a cow, they said, are you making fun of us? He answered, God forbid that I should be so ignorant, 2 hours 67 minutes. From the stories of your ancestors, remember what happened between them and Moses, peace be upon him, when he told them that Allah had instructed them to slaughter a cow. Instead of hurrying to do so, they said, stubbornly, are you making fun of us? Moses replied that he asked for Allah's protection from being one of the ignorant people who lied about Allah and made fun of other people. Al-Baqarah, 67 So initially, the children of Israel thought that Moses was mocking them. But Moses quickly corrected that mockery could never come from a prophet and he distanced himself from such an act by the expression familiar to Muslims I seek refuge in God from. But what we usually miss from this verse is the fact that Moses equated mockery to ignorance. So a learned man, or woman, should never mock anyone or anything under any circumstance. So the next question becomes, how do we deal with ignorance or ignorant people? Ignore the ignorant. The Quran tells us to dismiss the people of ignorance and not to give a lot of attention to them. It asks us to not engage with them in any conversation, except perhaps to safeguard ourselves from greater harm. For example, be tolerant, command what's right, pay no attention to foolish people, 7 199. Accept from people o messenger what they are able to do, the actions and conduct that is easy for them, and do not regire them to do things that are too difficult for them. Because that will drive them away. Instruct them to speak in a beautiful way and to do good actions, and turn away from those who are foolish and do not face them in their ignorance, returning like for like. Whoever harms you, do not harm them, and whoever denies you something, do not deny them. Al Araf 199. This is such an important matter that the Quran makes it one of the traits of the people of God. The servants of the Lord of mercy are those who walk humbly on earth, and who, when the foolish address them, reply peace. 25 63. The servants of the merciful are the believers who walk humbly on the earth with dignity. And when the foolish address them they do not retaliate in the same manner but they tell them something that saves them from their evil. al 63. The scholars of Quran have differed on the meaning of peace here. Some take it literally that you simply say the Muslim greeting of peace. But others have argued that peace here means that you end the conversation in a peaceful manner. Regardless of the difference in interpretation, I think we can all agree that the message of the Quran is to ignore the ignorant. On the other hand, we see the Quran encouraging us to engage with the people of reason and to even debate them if they have a different point of view. Call people to the way of your Lord with wisdom and good teaching, and argue with them in the most courteous way. 16 125. Invite O Messenger to the religion of Islam, you and the believers who follow you, in a manner that is appropriate for the condition. Understanding and mindset of the person who you are inviting and with admonition that contains encouragement and caution. Argue with them in the manner that is best in terms of speech, thought and politeness, for it is not your duty to guide people. You are only regired to convey the message to them. Your Lord knows best who has strayed from the religion of Islam and he knows best those who are rightly guided to it, so do not lose yourself in grief over them. al Nal, 125 I mention this here so no one comes and says that Islam forbids conversation with others. In fact, Islam encourages debate and the exchanging arguments. But people who mock a religious symbol are not interested in debate or logical arguments. It is the lack of logical arguments that makes them resort to mockery in the first place. Spare me the mockery. We can't leave this subject without contemplating a very interesting verse that speaks to the heart of the issue at hand. This verse addressed the Prophet Muhammad himself. It says, We have spared you those who ridicule you, 15 hours 95 minutes. Do not be afraid of them, for we are enough for you against those leaders of disbelief from the Quraysh who mock at you. Those who take another deity along with Allah. They will soon come to know the evil outcome of their associating partners with Allah. We know that your heart, O Messenger, is constrained by the rejection and mockery of you that emanates from them. So resort to Allah by declaring his transcendence from everything not appropriate for him, and by praising him with the attributes of his perfection. And be one of those who worship Allah and pray to him.
in that there is a cure for the strain on your heart. Go on worshipping your Lord and continue doing so as long as you live until death comes to you in that state. Al-Nal 95-99 In essence, the Quran is telling us that when it specifically comes to the issue of mocking the Prophet, Saw, which is exactly the issue that we are dealing with today. Don't take matters in your own hands, rather, God will take care of those who mock the Prophet. A call to respect the sanctity of Faith Symbols Lastly, another very interesting and very relevant verse to this discussion in the Quran says, Do not revile those they call on beside God, so they, in their hostility, revile God, without knowledge, 6 108. O believers, do not insult the idols that they worship alongside Allah, even though they be deserving of that, for then the idolaters due to ignorance would insult Allah unknowingly. A he be glorified. Just as he made their misguidance fair seeming to them, he makes the behavior of every nation, be it good or bad, seem good to them and so they act accordingly. Then their return on the day of rising is to their Lord, who will inform them about what they used to do in the world and repay their actions. al 108 the direct meaning of this verse is that reviling, insulting, or cursing the idols is prohibited because indirectly we are causing our God to be reviled, insulted or cursed. No matter how much we disagree with idol worship, we cannot mock, insult, or curse idols, idolaters, or idol worship. This verse is also teaching us that there are always consequences to our actions. Just like we hold our religious symbols very dear to our hearts and we consider them holy or untouchable, people of other faiths will feel the same towards their religious symbols. No matter how ridiculous those symbols may seem to us. Therefore, we should have mutual respect of religious symbols in order to live together in a civilized manner. At the least, we should, as they say, respectfully disagree.